Hello, and welcome to this SRC Learning Essentials series video about Spoke and Mesh STPs. If you are not familiar with the Service Routing Certification Program, you can learn more by visiting our website at www.networks.nokia.com src. In the following presentation, we will discuss what Spoke and Mesh STPs are, as well as explain how each of these affects the forwarding behavior in Layer 2 services. Once that is completed, we will test these behaviors on a VPLS in our lab environment. So, what is an STP and how does it become a spoke or mesh STP? Well, an STP is the transport tunnel that is used between PE routers. And when it is bound to a specific service, it is done as either a spoke or mesh STP binding. Each of these bindings determines how flooded traffic is transmitted. So let's now look at each behavior in more detail. This figure shows spoke STP flooding behavior from within the router. A frame is first received on a spoke STP to be flooded through the VPLS. It gets transmitted on both local SAPs, the other spoke STP, and both mesh STPs. This diagram shows a VPLS service with four PE routers connected by spoke STPs. The problem here is the STPs are configured to create a loop. For example, a broadcast, multicast, or unknown unicast Ethernet frame arrives from the SAP on PE4. PE4 floods it using the spoke STPs connected to all other PE routers in the service. PE routers 1, 2, and 3 flood it again to their local SAPs as well as to their other spoke SDPs. This loop causes unwanted and uncontrolled flooding of the frames. Now we will look at how the flooding behavior of mesh SDPs differ. This time we have a frame received on a mesh SDP to be flooded through the VPLS. It gets transmitted on both local SAPs and both spoke SDPs. Most importantly, it is not transmitted on the other mesh STP. Here we have the VPLS service again, but this time the PE routers are connected by mesh STPs. A broadcast, multicast, or unknown unicast Ethernet frame arrives from the SAP on PE4, who then floods it using the mesh STPs connected to all other PE routers in the service. PE routers 1, 2, and 3 flood it again to their local SAPs, but not along the other mesh SDPs. So here, you can really see how this fully mesh configuration ensures a loop-free environment. So, at this point, you may be thinking, if spoke SDPs can lead to uncontrolled flooding, then why use them at all? Well, there are certain situations where using spoke SDPs may be beneficial. The diagram shows our fully meshed VPLS service. A new customer site comes along to be added to the VPLS. However, it is connected to a PE router outside the VPLS domain. One option is to fully mesh PE5 into the VPLS service, which would require the creation of eight extra mesh SDPs. However, in certain network topologies, a better option is to provision only two spoke STPs between PE4 and PE5. This method is more scalable, as it reduces the overall packet replication and signaling overhead requirements, as well as increasing operational efficiency. With this new configuration, any frame coming from PE5 arrives at PE4 on a spoke STP and therefore is flooded on all the mesh STPs. Conversely, any frame arriving at PE4 is on a mesh STP and is flooded out the spoke STP to PE5. Next, we will move to our lab environment to complete this case study. VPLS 100 is configured on all the PE routers. However, notice that only PEs 1, 2, 3, and 4 are fully meshed. PE5 is connected only to PE1 by mesh STPs, and PE6 is connected only to PE2 also by mesh STPs. 
We need to ensure the CE devices can communicate with each other within VPLS 100. All right, so here we have our newly configured VPLS 100. Also note that currently there has not been any Mac learning in the service, and we can prove this by running show service ID 100 FDB detail on the PE routers. Now you can see here there are no FDB entries and I will tell you that if we ran this on any of the other PE routers you would see the same output. So a requirement states we must be able to ping between the CE routers. So let's first test this by going over to CE1 and running ping 192.168.1.2 As we can see, the ping fails. To help understand why the ping failed, we can start by looking at the FDB on PE5. So show service ID 100 FDB detail. And we can see an entry there for the MAC address of CE1 with the source of the VPLS SAP 112. So the frame has successfully arrived at PE5 and should now forward the frame to PE1 using the mesh SDP. So I'll move over to PE1 and check the FDB. Show service ID 100 FDB detail. And just like on PE5, we can see there is a MAC address for CE1 with a source though of the SDP5 and that is the mesh SDP. Next, because this is unknown unicast traffic, PE1 should then flood the frame to PE2, PE3 and PE4. So we can then move over to one of those routers and here is PE2 and check the FDB. So show service ID 100 FDB detail again but this time you'll see that the FDB is empty and that is because on PE1 the frame arrived on a mesh SDP so we'll therefore not forward it again out any other mesh SDPs so it will never reach PE2, PE3 or PE4. So the question is how can we change this configuration to make the ping successful? Well, as we have already learned, one option would be to fully mesh both PEs 5 and 6 into the VPLS service. That would actually require the creation of 14 extra mesh STPs, which is a lot of signaling overhead. The simplest method is to replace the mesh STPs between PE5 and PE1, as well as between PE6 and PE2, with spoke STPs. So over on PE5, I can view the SDPs by running show service ID 100 SDP. And we can see we have one mesh SDP going to 10.10.10.1, which is our PE1 router. So I first have to shut this down before I can remove it. So configure service VPLS 100 mesh SDP1 shutdown then remove it by running no mesh SDP1 now to replace it with a new spoke SDP so spoke SDP1 and give it a VCID value so I'll give it 100 create Okay, and we can confirm that it is created by running the show service ID 100 SDP command again. And there is our new spoke SDP to PE1 that is up and operational. Now over to PE1 and show service ID 100 SDP. And here we can see the mesh SDP going to a PE5. So to shut that down, configure service VPLS 100. 
mesh stp5 shut down then remove with no mesh stp5 and then of course replace with a new spoke stp so spoke sdp5 and we must use the same vcid so 100 create and then finally confirm show service id 100 SDP and here we can see the new spoke SDP up and operational just as it is on PE5. So at this point of course we're not completed because the frame would now get to PE2, 3 and 4 however it will never get to PE6 that is because it will then arrive on a mesh SDP and PE2 will not forward it out the mesh STP on PE6. So we still need to remove the mesh STPs between PE2 and PE6 and replace them with spoke STPs. So over to PE2 and show service ID 100 SDP. And there is the mesh STP to PE6. Configure service VPLS 100, mesh STP 6 shutdown, no mesh STP 6, and replace with a spoke, so spoke SDP 6 VCID 100, create, and then the same on PE 6. So there's our mesh STP. Configure service VPLS 100, mesh STP 2, shut down, no mesh STP 2, spoke STP 2 colon 100, create. And finally I can confirm that they're created successfully, so show service ID 100 SDP and there's our spoke STP that is operationally up. So now that we have spoke STPs between PE5 and PE1 as well as PE2 and PE6 the ping should succeed. So let's go back to CE1 and run the ping one more time. And there we can see that it is successful. If you like, you could then also go and view the FDB on the other routers. Show service ID 100, FDB detail, and there are the two MAC addresses, and then over to PE6, where we also have the MAC entries of both CE devices. And that about does it for this video on spoke and mesh SDPs. Thanks for watching and see you next time. Content for this video was adapted from the Nokia Services Architecture course. You can access the complete course via any of the three learning formats shown on this page, as well as get remote private access to a service router lab to complete the course lab exercises. If you are interested in obtaining an SRC certification, this table identifies the recommended courses and required exams for each of the five available certifications in the program.